I failed to build Pong, but this video isn't really about Pong. It's about networking and physics and being a little bit early to the Bevy ecosystem. So why was I trying to build Pong in the first place? Well, Pong is a fairly well-known game. It was the first game built by Atari and has been replicated so many times since that it's in a bunch of CS classes and boot camps and everything as a standard procedure. That description alone should tell you that you don't need a physics library to implement Pong. After all, Atari built this in hardware. They didn't even have software. The Pong playing area is made up of four walls, two paddles, and a ball. So a ball hitting the ceiling without using a physics library is just checking whether the Y position of the ball is greater than the Y position of the ceiling, and that will tell us whether or not it needs to have hit the wall. The speed and direction of the ball can be represented as two components of a vector. So the X component and the Y component. If the ball hit the ceiling, we can reverse the Y component of this velocity, which will send the ball back down. Compared to other games, Pong has a small rule set and not very many moving pieces. This makes it perfect to use as a base to introduce other aspects of game development. And this is why I chose to build Pong. I already have single player driven workshops on Rust Adventure, 2048 and Snake, which cover core bevy concepts in a single player environment. I've also built a version of Arkanoid or Block Breaker using the Rapier 2D physics library, as well as other games like a 2D platformer. If I can take the Block Breaker clone and imbue that with multiplayer networking, then the two workshops would fit together very well. One of the workshops introducing paddle control, ball physics, collision, and despawn areas, and the other one building on top of that with multiplayer networking. So what options do we have for building multiplayer bevy games? Speaking extremely broadly, we have three options. Client server architecture, P2P networking, and local multiplayer. The easiest approach by far is local multiplayer. In Bevy, you can either read input directly or use a wonderful third-party crate like Leafwing Input Manager. Either way, this allows you to use different keys on the same keyboard, different gamepads, or any other input that you may have laying around. There's only one instance of this game, which means that we don't need to deal with networking at all. All of the inputs are running from the same keyboard, let's say, into the same game instance. A client server architecture, on the other hand, is often used when you don't trust the client or don't want to trust the client. This is important in competitive games where you play online like Rocket League or Fortnite, where people are competing for hundreds of thousands of dollars in tournaments. Any given client shouldn't be able to set their health to say a thousand percent or move their car automatically teleporting to block any goal. The source of truth for these positions and interactions should be the server, which is running its own simulation. P2P or peer-to-peer -peer, then is a networking model where two game instances communicate directly without a server in the middle. Somewhat obviously, this game has very different constraints when it comes to cheating, and especially compared to the authoritative server model, we don't have an authoritative server that neither of the clients can access. So if you're syncing state in some way, one client could send bad state to the other client, negatively affecting the gaming experience. The big benefit of P2P networking in my mind is that people learning how to do these things then don't have to also run a server, worry about scaling those servers, worrying about constructing lobbies and dealing with all of that extra server infrastructure. This makes, in my opinion, P2P a much better learning resource approach if it fits the game, because it makes it more likely that the game developer is going to be able to share this and actually play it with their friends. You don't have to learn an additional domain of deploying servers. So we've decided to contend with the network. This adds a whole host of complexity and problems that didn't exist in our single player games. The internet, as it turns out, is kind of awful and extremely unreliable. I mean, the internet is clearly a marvelous technology and without it, you wouldn't even be watching this video, but it's also a source of incredible complexity. For example, there's no guarantee that a connection will even hold through a single gameplay session. And even if you can hold a connection, there's no guarantee that that connection between two players is any good for the entire gameplay session. But Chris, you say, I have symmetrical fiber. Putting aside the fact that both players would have to have symmetrical fiber, everything between those two computers also has to sustain that level of a connection. And it has to do so for the entire game for it to matter. And as it turns out, your connection speed doesn't even matter that much. There are physical limitations for how fast data can get from one place on Earth to another. According to one source, the theoretical maximum speed that you can get data from, say, Stanford to Boston is 40 milliseconds. But that's the speed of light, not the speed of the internet, which is about two times slower. So we'll say 80 milliseconds. That means that if we're running a multiplayer game and you have two players on the East Coast and West Coast of the United States, you are running at a starting state of a five frame lag. 
even if your connection, their connection, and everything in between is doing great. There are a lot of techniques for dealing with this problem, as it's a problem for basically every multiplayer game that exists. But one technique that keeps coming up is client-side prediction. With or without a server, you want the client to be able to run the simulation for the local user so that when a user pushes a button, it feels instant, even if that information has to transition over the internet to somebody on the other coast. This is even true if after sending that information, you realize that you made a mistake and you have to deal with something and change the output. One approach to this is called rollback networking. This approach is fairly popular in the fighting game scene, but is also used to some extent in games like Rocket League. And if Rocket League can use it to simulate some ball and car physics, we should be able to simulate a smaller, easier version with two paddles and a ball. The big difference, of course, is that Rocket League is a server authoritative game, and they don't rely on total determinism of their physics pipeline. Instead, issuing corrections from the server, which compensate for the fact that different computers process information differently. And if we look at the fighting game implementations like Slippy for Super Smash Bros. Melee, they don't include random, non-user initiated balls flying around the screen. There are two very useful crates for dealing with rollback networking and matchmaking in Bevy. These are Matchbox and GGRS. Matchbox is an implementation of WebRTC-based peer-to-peer networking. Now, peer-to-peer -peer is great, but there's also the problem of establishing the first connection, which is kind of complicated in a P2P situation because you have to punch through NAT holes and things like that. Matchbox also helps us here by providing a binary or a server that we can run to help initiate that initial connection and then pass it back to just the peer-to-peer -peer socket. The Bevy integration for Matchbox is straightforward to set up. And there's a great tutorial series called Extreme Bevy that makes use of Matchbox and explains Matchbox and in fact, GGRS in more detail. Thanks for this resource, Johan. The Extreme Bevy example, as well as other examples on the internet, make use of GGRS, which is a re-implementation or a reimagining of GGPO. Rollback networking relies very hard on simulation and determinism in your physics. And in fact, in the rest of the game as well. The only data that crosses over the network then is the input buttons that a user is pressing. This means that after I press buttons, the other player, after a latency delay, receives those inputs, has to roll back their simulation of what happened, and replay those frames to catch back up, including my inputs. This does work, but it relies on a high degree of determinism in the way that your game behaves. Every action taken at a specific state of your game needs to have the same result on all systems that are playing the game. This determinism can be negatively affected in many ways. First, floating point math can behave differently on different systems. Wasm may be more deterministic, but native platforms like Mac, Linux, Windows, or even like a Switch or something have the potential to behave differently. And this can have important impacts on the results of your calculations. Now it is in general, theoretically and practically possible to get Rapier 2D to behave deterministically in a cross-platform manner. You have to, of course, restrict yourself to using certain functions but I wasn't able to get this to work over longer periods of time on separate clients. The ball in my Pong example always eventually desyncs. Additionally, there are issues that you can run into with Bevy itself. The order of query results isn't guaranteed. So you have to sort all of the queries for which the order of a query result could result in non-determinism in your game. So basically at this point, it's not an out of the box experience in the Bevy Rust ecosystem for these physics crates to support these networked use cases. This sort of dashes my hopes of being able to build further on the Pong example being networked to build more interesting physics-based P2P games, especially for workshops. It is after all hard to tell somebody that they have to go build their own physics implementation if they want to build, I don't know, a version of Minecraft or something. Now it is presently possible as shown in this example repo, but it does come with some restrictions and it is important to note that it's not a priority in the ecosystem right now, or at least it doesn't seem to be. So having rollback compatible physics systems, if you go down this path, means that you will have to be responsible for updating your implementation whenever these physics libraries update. And the amount of code it takes to get this to work is non-trivial. There are some really useful features in Rapier like the enhanced determinism flag, and you are supposed to have cross-platform deterministic simulations. But the experience of using all of this and putting it together isn't enough for me to casually suggest that you should go out and build a rollback networking based physics simulation game without a deep understanding of Bevy, the physics engine you're using, and Rust. That said, there is some interesting physics work being done in a new crate. 
Bevy XPBD. XPBD tries to integrate more deeply with Bevy itself, and one of the goals of the project is being well documented, which is really nice. While Rapier maintains its own physics world and sort of syncs with Bevy, XPBD is built for Bevy and with Bevy. XPBD makes a stronger commitment to using Bevy's ECS for APIs both internally and externally. XPBD, which I have trouble saying in the right order every time, is based on a concept called extended position-based dynamics, while the Rapier physics system is built on top of impulses and velocities. Extended position-based dynamics is newer, and as expected, Bevy XPBD is also newer, and this means it's less developed than Rapier at the current time. But it is an exciting new entry into the Bevy physics ecosystem and may make this kind of rollback P2P networking-based game easier to build in the future. This is especially true as XPBD was inspired by Johan's own work with Matchbox and GGRS in their own games. So where does that leave Pong? Well, the paddles work and the inputs sync just fine. So I could remove the ball in the physics entirely and build a different game like Tic-Tac-Toe or another turn-based piece of software. This would definitely allow me to introduce the concept of P2P networking, but I feel like it doesn't make full use of the WebRTC connection. And Pong is, of course, a game that doesn't need a physics engine. So one path forward is using the simpler non-physics crate based collision detection. This works if your only goal is to make Pong work, but doesn't extend easily to other more complicated games. I would like this example to be a base from which learners could jump off and build their own more complicated physics based P2P games. And for that, I feel like we would need a physics crate that works specifically for this use case. So I'm hopeful that Bevy XPBD will be that crate in the future moving forward and I'll continue to experiment with it as it grows. In the meantime, I'll use Matchbox to develop different, maybe more turn-based games, or less physics-based at least, because it really was a joy to get Matchbox and GGRS up and running and seeing that working over a network connection. Hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Have a great rest of your day.